Yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I, I will move around a bit. So the, uh, the URL of the presentation is up there, uh, and there's a short article about that uh, I wrote a while ago. Um, the presentation, as well as the article, and everything that I'm about to talk about, uh, and the papers and so on, are in um, HTML and RDFA. So you can dereference the slide in question. Um, and if you have something to say about that slide, you can make a triple. So, um, thank you for inviting me, uh, and let's get to it. I will let you consume this. All media are extensions of, human, uh, of some human faculty, psychic or physical, uh, said by Marshall McLuhan. Um, so th I'm going to start the talk from up here and then dive down. And I think the, uh, the philosophy of media and, and how it impacts uh, the societies is important. So uh, to explain that, I'm going to let you just consume these images. Go back, read that again. So what he was talking about is basically the way we used media uh, and our senses uh, basically shaped our societies. We were in villages and telling stories to each other. That's how we transfer knowledge. Uh, we use our uh, senses to, well, to see and to hear and the body language to consume this information. So it was an oral culture, right? And we went into print, uh, print and became a well, visual, uh, primarily visual uh, culture, right? Everything is uh, written down, uh, read in a sequential manner, uh, represented in a two-dimensional space. It's internalized, it's somewhat antisocial. And the explosion of the printing press. We have the telephone, right? We're using our different senses again uh, to hear, right? So while I'm talking on the phone, my other senses are not occupied, right? So I can actually look at something else uh, as I'm listening to someone on the phone. Whereas if I'm looking at a print, printed pa paper, um, my, my vision and my focus is primarily on that paper. Uh, I can't really, you know, carry out a conversation or listen to uh, uh, someone give a speech while reading a paper. Maybe some people can, but it's, I can't. I think most people can't either. So the census pretty much tells us how we consume this and what it really means in the end to actually have access to this information. So there's a radio. It's a bit social, right? People gather around. TV looks pretty social to me. They watch, you know, they can have their feedback, annotate what they're seeing in the living room. Hypertext, the 60s, right? So it's interactive. Now you're using your hands. And then, you know, who, who knows where the future is going? But um, I'll just stop there. I mean, I don't, we don't need to go cover all types of media here. But the point is that th uh, the media that we bet on or how we, uh, how we want to consume and transfer knowledge um, it, it, it entirely shapes uh, the societies, right? So we went from oral culture to a, to a written culture, and then we have an interactive culture like the web, right? So people can talk on the web and you know, tweet each other and so on. So this talk is going to be about uh, how you should, why you should control uh, the link or academic research yourself, and you should use a native web stack to do it. Um, I don't need to convince you that, or anyone here or listening, that the web works. Uh, it's been working for 
fairly 26 years. Uh, it may fail, but uh, there's no sign of it. So this electronic way of this medium that we're using to communicate uh, and to interact and to share knowledge, it's been working fairly well. So then the question is, how cool is scholarly communication, right? So around for 15th century, uh, printing press came out, 19, around 1989, 90s uh, web, right? So what, what, what changed in how we share uh, knowledge or research knowledge in, in this particular case? What we're doing is, again, we're strictly using our visual system. Uh, we're reading each character, uh, each word, one, one after another. It's non-interactive, other than the fact that you may print a paper and you know, annotate it and scribble on the side of it. It's somewhat antisocial because you're by yourself, you're focused on what you're reading. Um, of course, you, know, you may interrupt yourself and you know, talk to someone else. And what, in the end, what we're doing is uh, we're just imitating paper, right? So we have this two-dimensional space that we came up with uh, to represent stuff which, um, you know, anywhere from having scientific information to uh, religious documents um, with typographical rules and so on, and to, to today, right? And we're, we're still doing the same thing. We're pretty much betting on that two-dimensional system of way of communicating. But the web is about uh, it's interconnected ideas, right? It's, we're intermingling on, on the web. We're sharing uh, not just uh, you know, the documents, but, where our, but our opinions about these things. So the web is, you know, brings back that social uh, uh, connectivity that we had a long time ago. It's like it is a global village, as also Marshall McMoon says. So the problem, as I see with the scholarly communication, is that, well, well, there's many problems. I think you're quite aware of that as well. One of them is the user experience problem. So when we're looking at a PDF or Word document and so on, these are essentially paper user interfaces, right? Two dimensions. There may be some hyperlinks in there, but it's you know when you uh, when you submit a paper to a conference, what are the submission requirements? It says something like, well, it has to be in 12 pages, in this uh, font size, in English, uh, and you know make sure you make sure you follow the Springer's uh, layout rules, right? And you know. Given the age that we're, we're, you know, the web, right? We're betting on that still. And that's producing, of course, uh, data silos. Uh, these papers, authoritative in a way, documents are ending up on Springer or Elsevier or any, you know, name a publisher, right? We're handing out these documents uh, to reside in, on their websites, which we essentially don't have any control over. You don't own the domain, essentially. And they don't play well with the web. They're just binary documents, PDFs. Uh, you can't get, get, back to, get, get the source back. Um, it's not that accessible. Uh, have you tried searching for text uh, in, let's say, Google Scholar for a particular fragment in a paper as opposed to a, just a web document? Right? When you do look at the search results, you get a lot more uh, out of it when, when, you, when you're looking at an HTML document in search results as opposed to a PDF document, right? How many papers are out there which c declare the hypotheses of the paper? Or how would you even um, extract that information, right? Or what's the workflow step uh, which resulted in where you get the, the data set from, right? None of that information is really easily accessible. It's just what we do is a big blob of text we put it into a binary file, lock it away, give it to a third party, and then, you know, here's your degree. So we have a discovery and a reuse problem. We can't query for these atomic parts because I want to know what your hypothesis is or what your methods were so that I can say something about it from my paper, right? I want to say, I agree with that particular statement you made in that sentence, in that paragraph, right? Not, you know, a document here and a, and a citation at the bottom of the of the paper saying something about that, like which is it's arbitrary relation. It's not a, it's not as specific as it could be. So we 
if we can, you know, discover, identify these parts, which also means that we can all do other things around it, right? We can figure out the research gaps, right? So what are the trends of the, the research uh, in, in that particular year? What are, what are, we, what are we discovering, right? Um, or find out new areas that sh we should be researching on. Or even further, what about the funding opportunities? Who, how should I assemble a team? Who should be on my team? If you link the profiles with the authors and the papers, you can get, all, get, to, get to all that. So um, I think that we have a paradigm shift that's needed and that's uh, unfortunately been lagging about 25, 50 years, depends how you look at it, 25 or so years, the web, 50 years maybe for the hypertext and the internet and so on. Um, we're that behind. We have the technology, but uh, we haven't really adapted to that. So I propose that we fix the user experience um, so that we can have better accessibility and also you know, discover this information and move these, this information body of knowledge from dif through different devices or through different senses in the end, right? So it's not just the printed material that you're looking at in your hand but, or on a screen, but uh, you can move it to your device uh, or hear it, uh, watch it, Whatever, whichever, however way is, is suitable. So to do that, I think that we need to start with an acid test, and that's basically just a fancy way of saying we need to figure out the use cases and you know how, how do we uh, uh, represent these scholarly documents, academic uh, papers, of course. Um, that is, if we if we buy into the idea that okay, I want to be able to discover. Uh, somebody's hypotheses or, and, or arguments and conclusions and so on, or the figures even. Um, how, how do we do that, right? So we, we need, we, if we agree on, as, as, that, as that one of the problems, then we can sort of go after it. The technology, so I, I, of course I'm going to, you probably have a good sense of what I'm going to propose, but the technology is not the important part, it's just that we agree on the problem and, and then if you have a, di a different way of solving that, that's great. If, you, if your PDF can do that, if your bitmap image can do that, great, go for it. But there are other perhaps suitable uh, technologies in place uh, which uh, seems to be proven to work and maybe they're better bets to go with. So I won't go too much in this, I'll, I'll just fly through them. So the c there's a call for linked research and the idea is that you publish your work now. You don't need to wait for uh, someone to give you a go ahead. You can publish it on your own website or on your institution's website, at your library, uh, or at your company, whoever or whatever gives you that sense of trust and control over your own uh, research document. So you don't have to give it to a third party company, for instance. I don't mean that you, you, know, you should publish it on your friend's website, but that the sense of trust is up to you. So whether that document will be around, uh, how it will be accessed, these are the questions that you or we uh, collectively probably have to uh, figure out, but um, instead of just going along with you know, status quo. So if you have control the URI of your own article, you publish it using the web, webby uh, technologies, uh, then you can do all the rest of the stuff uh, which you know, helps you with knowledge acquisition, better experience, you, you, you interlink it with the other documents, other arguments, uh, you, and so on. And of course, you want to motivate others to do the same. So self-publish, self-archive, edit web space, you control and trust. That's one of the main messages. And while we're doing that, we're of course trying to identify the interesting parts of our documents, right? So if I think that my hypothesis is worthy of attention or someone to link with, then I will go ahead and you know, mark that part or declare that that is my hypothesis right there. So if you have something to say about my paper, don't just say I disagree with your paper, say that you disagree with that atomic part in that paper, right? Maybe you agree with mo you know, majority of the paragraphs, but there's a paragraph that you strongly disagree with. You can say I disagree with that. You know this, I will skip this, skip this. These are some of the slides for anyone that's not here. 
So here's an example, uh, which we can, so these slides are also interactive. Um, I have it on a web page maybe, but if you look closely to that graph, it's a slide, uh, it says spark line by, usually pr proposed by Edward Tufte. It's actually loading uh, from a live endpoint, so some bunch of uh, statistical data from a start, uh, statistical endpoint, and it's an SVG which just loads it back into the page. So did, I have a paper that actually does the exact same thing. I just put that on a slide as well. So there's no difference between the slides and the papers. It's all HTML. Or here's another part of a paper or whatever. I can interact with it. I can type some concept and type through. So I'm doing this in, in directly in my slides, but it could be on a web page. So you announce it, you, you create awareness, of course, get some feedback. So one of the tools, of course, th there are different approaches. So I'm, I'm only proposing one, so one approach uh, to do this, and this is the one I'm working on. Um, I'm not trying to sell you this. I'm, I'm trying to sell you the acid test, the, you know, the call for lead research, right? That's the initiative. That's, those are the principles that we should go after. This is just one way of doing it. If that's useful to you, use it. Um, or use another tool that's, that you prefer. So it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be completely decentralized uh, in a way that you as the author can decide where you put it um, using your own web ID um, and your own personal store space and you can give access to whoever you want. Um, so just on that remark, uh, if someone wants to come and annotate your paper, um, that annotation or the comment or reply or any sort of social interaction with that document, that information doesn't have to be embedded or necessarily live in that document. It can exist somewhere else, right? So your annotation belongs to you. You are the author of that and you decide where you want to store it. And it can be anywhere on the web, right? Anywhere you trust or have control over. So Dokili, it's derived from um, Okie Doki and linked. We'll, we'll see whether that's a good name or not. I don't know. It took me a while to come up with it, but <laughs> kind of stuck with it. So, um, so it's, friend, it's friends with uh, the linked data platform and Solid. Solid is a social linked data platform, which is uh, friends with linked data platform. It's just a thin layer which lets you do, uh, it extends linked data platform to do more social things. Uh, it's also friends with web, the web annotations workgroups output and the social web workgroups output but primarily on the data model. Um, basically, the vocabularies that they have, uh, it's used in Dokili. So when you make an annotation, um, it, you know, not only is it stored somewhere else, but you know, that RDF uh, within it is using those vocabularies. So I'm happy to demo that later if you like. Uh, so I'll switch over to a little bit other things around this. Uh, the CUR uh, workshop proceedings, which is the largest open access publisher in computer science, um, will support Dokili. We've, we have a CUR make, which is, uh, it's on GitHub. So the, the green things are links. You can get to them on the presentations, uh, on, on the presentation slides. Um, you can uh, basically export, for now, you can export the, the data that you get from EasyChair, run it through Kermit and that gives you, generates an HTML RDFA document. So now we have the proceedings in, in RDF, right? So imagine all the Kerr, uh, from now on, all the Kerr uh, proceedings which were generated will have that. Um, so now we have, you know, we, this, is, this, is, this all exists, it's not hypothetical, it works, okay? So I'll, all my papers are published in this way and the Kerr is taking this on and as well. So we have now, we can now have a body of papers, right? All these papers with you know, all their atomic parts linked, interlinked, discoverable with the proceedings, right? So this paper was, or appeared in, in the proceedings. The proceedings says that that was, you know, that includes or has a part of that paper, right? The paper also says that this was a reply to a call for paper, right? So a call for paper is a particular theme of that year. Right? So all the calls linked with the, all the papers and the proceedings. And this whole concept of pay as you go works. Uh, 
this is, has not been announced yet, but uh, in, in the next weeks, uh, the LinkedIn on the Web workshop uh, will um, make an announcement that uh, HTML and friends are welcome. If you want to use your own tooling or uh, Doakly or whatever, that's, that's fine. As long as, you know, we kind of uh, keep things consistent with the rest of the submissions, you know, we may, for, for, as an interim solution, we'll go with that uh, ACM layout, which is fine. Because what's important is that, you know, I can actually dereference your paper, right? So, uh, like I said, I'm happy to get into more details on the, uh, uh, on, on this, the tooling and the link research and the breakout session. I hope you join. Uh, if you have ideas or tooling that you want to suggest, that's perfect for it. Um, so now a little, some fun stuff. Um, so I published uh, one of my papers ended up, unfortunately, at Springer because I want to get my PhD degree at some point, so I have to comply with the rules of the conference, um, so on. So, uh, you know, I signed the, the copyright form and I, you know, gave the LaTeX to them. I included the URL to the paper, which is published on my site, and somehow ended up on Springer. So if you go to the Springer's, uh, Springer um, and get to this paper, you can decide what you want to do. If, you're not, if you don't have access to it uh, from a library or whatever, right? And somewhat recent news, I I'm sorry I'm picking up Springer, but it applies to all publishers. Um, so a colleague uh, tweeted this. It's, it seems you know, it's good news that their, their meta metadata, I emphasize that, all of the proceedings is now available as linked data. Great. Um, but I still can't find out anything about your research. What the hypothesis is great that, you know, the authors or the keywords or the abstract was uh, available. I mean, I can get that from a website as well. You just have to, you know, do some cleaning. But um, I think we can do more. That's the whole point. So uh, I will leave it. It here uh, we can discuss. Uh, questions are welcome. I'm, I can also. I, I don't know if you have more time. I can even demo. We have time, so I'll just go a little bit more than planned. But yeah. So I just show parts of Dokili. So it looks something like this, right? So this is just a test page, right? It looks like a normal paper. Uh, I can turn that into ACM paper. It's just a CSS change. There's nothing fancy here. This problem was solved 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, I can link to the introduction. So each of these paragraphs or anything, like I said, of worthy of attention, you as the author can decide, okay, I want that, you know, fragment to be available on the web. So underneath it, there's RDFA and so on, right? I can, um, th this menu needs an update, but I mean, you can do these things. You can embed some turtle or whatever. You can in edit. So now this works like in, in browser authoring, right? You can do the normal formatting stuff like you're used to. Now I can also, you know, um, uh, okay, that's good up. <laughs> So, let's do that. Anyway, <laughs> that annotation is not, it's, it's stored in a different location, right? So I ha I'm the author because I'm, I signed in it with my web ID to this document and I have the control, I had the right access to it. Everybody else can get a read access. So this document, the paper itself, uh, you know, has a read and it acts as a view layer for, for that annotation, but you can access the the, uh, the paper by itself. This is the paper. Uh, sorry, this is the annotation itself. Nothing fancy there. Let's look at. Here's a another paper of mine. It's on a website. On my website. It's just like a blog post, right? Nothing fancy. We have comments, right? It's track link or the argument link. Um, 
So it's LNS CS, right? So it's a Springer's layout. If I want to, you know, if I really want the PDF for it, I can just print PDF. There's a print style sheet for it, right? Make it ACM. We can, I mean, generate hundreds of uh, layouts if that's what we're after. But the goal is not, you know, that we have this fixed view of of, uh, of the academic work. We may have a preferred view for it because maybe that's a better way of communicating it. But on the web, it doesn't need to be fixed, right? You want to move these documents around into different um, locations and different devices and so on, and used by different people at different times, not just today, but maybe in you know 50 years from now and so on. You can pretend that this paper is a W3C recommendation, right? You can pretend that Tim Berners-Lee wrote this paper. Right. Or, I mean, there's interactive parts of it. Like I said, this graphic, which I showed you earlier. It's also part of the paper. You can interact with it. You can run queries, right, on a paper. And it's just a Sparkle query editor, nothing fancy, but it works, right? So by enabling these things into these web documents, we let the, aud the reader sort of uh, learn better, right? You want to, that's, that's the goal. You want to get, uh, you want to get a credit for your, what you wrote, but you also want to help the reader understand it. So if you have an algorithm, you don't just dump in the, the code there or the, the pseudocode there or whatever, the algorithm, but you can let the, the reader play with it, right? Because then you can learn better. You can interact with it, you can change, you can execute the paper to see whether it's valid, right? Whether all these workflow steps uh, are, are, are right and whether you can reproduce the same results uh, that the paper was talking about. Or if you change the values, what happens then, right? Can you break the paper? Anyway, and there's all sorts of, I, I, like, this is all breakout stuff, but, like, you know, we can talk about the provenance, persistence of these URIs, and so on. Um, I'll just stop there, because I think, like, this could be a 40 minutes or, you know, five-hour talk. Um, and I think we were here. No. No. We were here. Here. So, uh, yeah, questions and comments. Uh, tell me what you don't like and what your problems are and why, what will it take for you to publish your own work under a web space that you control instead of just handing out a LaTeX or a PDF or a Word or whatever to a conference and so on. Because I know that most of you have some sort of web space under the institutions that you're at, right? You're, University probably gives you a web space that says here's, you know, you can, or you can ask IT if you don't know it, but you can get a hold of it. So you're able to publish it. Uh, it takes 30 seconds to create a WordPress account, 30 seconds to write a web document. So it's not that it's not feasible. Uh, the, it, like I said, it's, it, the HTML uh, is proven to work, uh, is yet to fail, so, um, and there was a, good reason as to why Tim Bernsey picked HTML or decided on something like HTML where you can view the source and have your document in a, written in a declarative fashion as opposed to having something like LaTeX or Tech where you have to compile it and maybe break, right? But instead of coding it, programming it. So happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Savin.